Hello and welcome to the Luke Wade Center for Dyslexia and Learning Disorders at Scottish Rite for Children. Dyslexia has been a part of Scottish Rite for over 55 years, and we are excited to share our history and heritage with you today. Welcome. My name is Gladys Kalinowski, the Administrative Director of the Luke Waits Center, retired. And I am welcoming you to the room that we fondly call the museum. It's a room that was a vision of Dr. Waits, but we honor him in this room. Dr. Waits was the founder of the Luke Waits Center here and at Scottish Rite for Children, and a part of today we'll be telling the story and how his leadership intersected with Ailet Cox. If you are a teacher teaching children with dyslexia, you are a part of a rich heritage that most of you will find your heritage began with Ayla Cox and her determination to bring a dyslexia program for children to Dallas and one that blossomed throughout North Texas and the state of Texas and beyond. A parallel track is one taken by Dr. Luke Waits until their lives and professions intersected. Dr. Waits was very much the diagnostician, evaluating and identifying children with dyslexia. So if you are a part of evaluating children, I can assure you that your heritage stems from Dr. Waits and bringing the determined, dogged determination to see that children with dyslexia were not only correctly identified, but had access to a program that could open the doors for them to success. Our museum is organized with a timeline at the top leading to the early and then ongoing influences in dyslexia intervention at Scottish Rite for Children. Then there are the stories of individuals who made contributions to the program. And below we have the materials that were so important in the development of interventions here at Scottish Rite. Early influences include the neurological identification of a unique failure to learn to read in spite of other talent, skills, and abilities, the beginning of Scottish Rite for Children, and then the American pioneer who brought the understanding of the diagnosing and appreciation for dyslexia to the American medical scene. In the 20s, 1920s, 30s, and 40s, Dr. Samuel T. Orton was that leader. He took his understanding of neurological anatomy and the association of all aspects of language to one another, as well as the neural pathways for developing memory, and applied those to intervention principles. Anna Gillingham was a school administrator and psychologist who partnered with Bessie Stillman. In developing intervention techniques, they developed what they called the language triangle, the connection between the visual, the auditory, and the kinesthetic senses. Anna Gillingham developed rules and situations and generalizations of the written language and took language as we know it down to its smallest part, the phoneme, and taught children through the language triangle aspects of written language with the phoneme, the syllable, the word, the phrase, and the sentence. And then collected that information and organized it into what's known as the Gillingham Manual, or Old Red, the first of the Gillingham materials that form a foundation of later curricula development. So Stillman and Gillingham began training teachers, and their method of training teachers was a one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationship. And this was not one person sitting in a classroom with a master instructor. These women would come to live with you. 
stay with you daily developing lesson plans for students, observing you teach those students, giving you feedback, as well as role modeling their expectations for you. So this program was developing in the 30s, 40s, and early 50s in the Northeast. By the early 50s, there was a Dallas family who had a young son who was not learning to read. And this family was determined to find help. Through their research and investigation, they found the Gillingham program in the Northeast. But Anna was at an age at that point, she was unable to take on the one-to-one -one mentorship of someone from Dallas. This family had found and recruited a neighbor named Aylett Cox, and Aylett was willing to go. And in contact to Sally Childs, who was the professional heir to Anna Gillingham, Sally Childs recommended the woman that was the closest to Dallas who had taken the training and was uh, doing the training in Kansas City, Kansas. Her name was Genevieve Mossman. And Aylett went to Kansas City where she lived with Genevieve for months at a time. And then Genevieve came to Dallas during Aylett's second year. And by 1960, Aylett was trained in the Orton Gillingham method. I was lucky enough to be in one of the classes that Aylett Cock was, was the teacher. I, she was my instructor for my first six weeks of my teacher training. So I spent six weeks with her one summer at Scottish Rite, and at that point the training moved over to Dean Learning Center, so to finish my advanced training, the second year of training, the next summer I went to Dean Learning Center and uh, continued my training there. I am deeply grateful to Aylett Cox because when we had Paige tested at Scottish Rite Hospital, Dr. Luke Waits told us she is the most severely blocked child we have ever tested. That led us to Ayla Cox, who was then training at Scottish Rite Hospital. And my husband said, I think you better take that training because if we get transferred overseas again, then there won't be anybody to help Paige. I tried all the strategies that I'd been taught um, in my bachelor's degree, and none of them really worked. But when I went to hear Aylett talk, I thought, you know, this might be the very thing that I was looking for. And at the time, she didn't have a class that was uh, when I could attend class, so I began my training at the Shelton School in Dallas. My fondest memory of her is when she was retired and she came to Shelton when we were on Lover's Lane and she wanted to volunteer and work with a child because she just needed that uh, to continue that wonderful, rewarding uh, experience that we have in working with these children. She worked with a boy that was extremely severely dyslexic. And one day in the hall, she told me, I don't know, Joyce, but I'm trying, and she did. She got a breakthrough with him. By 1961, the director of the Hockaday School for Girls in Dallas, Texas, approached Aylett Cox and wanted to develop a dyslexia program at the Hockaday School. And they contacted Sally Childs, who was willing to come down and supervise that program and stayed in touch with that program coming down every year for five years to make sure the Dallas Dyslexia Program got underway. Aylett understood the language like no one I have ever known in my lifetime. She was just able to teach without even looking at a note. She would, no PowerPoint or anything like we have today when we train our teachers. She's just amazing the depth of it, and she wrote structures and techniques, put all of that information down so that we would have it. She was very precise and very systematic with the way that you follow those procedures, the way that they're set out, and you don't make changes because that's what makes the difference for the students. And so you follow that fidelity to the program. In Aylett Cox textbook, Foundations for Literacy, 
there is a sentence that that's an answer to a question that she was asked by someone. Someone asked her, do you teach um, adults the same way you teach children? And she said, it's just the opposite. We teach children the same way we would teach adults. And she was such a strong um, advocate for our children and was very precise in everything that she did. And I think her precision is what has carried us to where we are now with continuing with those procedures and that precision in how we teach children. She was so approachable, and if I had a question, she was just ready to answer it in, in a New York minute. She always had that answer on the tip of her lips. Sally Childs came to Dallas to work with ALIT to begin training teachers in Dallas, and Sally's um, framework, if you will, because it was Anna Gillingham's framework, is to teach 101. But what they quickly found, based on the strong encouragement of Dr. Waits, was that they needed to train more than one teacher at a time because we had too many children that needed to learn this new way um, for reading instruction. Now, on a parallel track in 1961, Dr. Waits was at a meeting with the Dean of Pediatrics at Children's Medical Center, now Children's Health. And they were meeting with a group of members of the Junior League of Dallas over a volunteer project that was to be developed at Children's Medical Center. This was in the late summer of 1961. As the meeting broke up, one of the women, one of the mothers in the group, said to the two from Children's Met, Dr. Waits and the Dean, it sure would be great if you were to develop a program to help children with their reading difficulties. Now, Dr. Waits was a pediatric neurologist for Children's Medical Center, but when he moved to Dallas in 1960, he brought with him a passion that has, had developed through the years. When he was at the University of Chicago in medical training, his mentor, was in charge of evaluations for the young men incarcerated in the juvenile detention. And Dr. Waits saw his mentor do something unusual for a pediatric neurological evaluation. He had each young man read. And it struck Dr. Waits how the vast majority were either non-readers or very poor readers for their age. And it put on his heart that there were young people who deserve the opportunity for success. Dr. Waits had been at the University of Oklahoma Medical School until about 1960 when he joined the staff of the Children's Health Hospital. That late summer meeting at Children's Health led to some very rapid responses. In November, a group of parents that became known as the Vigilantes had a group meeting in a home. Just the name tells you the passion and the way these parents were ready to act in order to provide and fund and bring about a program for children with dyslexia. By January of 1962, Dr. Waits made a speech to the Junior League of Dallas membership. He always described what happened after that meeting. He spoke at the podium at the Dallas Women's Club. After the meeting, the line was up the aisle and out the door of mothers who needed help for their children and who were there just to ask, what about this, what about that? And again, it was a reaffirmation that there was a need for a program. By April of 1962, he had met through one of the vigilantes, Alec Cox, and they began an intersection of working together. Dr. Waits said, I will do the diagnosis and evaluation at Children's Health, and you will train the teachers at the Hockaday School. And the teachers will receive referrals from our clinic 
to them and they will begin the treatment of those children there in the classrooms at Hockaday. And that began a wonderful relationship. He was always determined that if he was going to identify the dyslexia, there would be a place to send those children. Now her first teacher training group was made up of eight teachers. And there was some significant arm twisting with Sally Childs to get Sally to agree that these teachers could be trained in small groups rather than in that intensive, live-in, one-to-one type of training. And the training went very well. They were very pleased and had 22 teachers by the next year. Teachers who began in the training with ALIT were generally those women who had been personally impacted by dyslexia. They were passionate. They had seen what dyslexia could do to their own family, whether a parent, a spouse, or a child, or themselves. And it was that drive that they were determined to not only receive the training from ALIT, but to do their very best for each child. And each early generation of those involved in dyslexia programs were often drawn by their personal experience because there were no success stories at that point. There were no children who had received intervention and shown a response to that intervention. There were certainly children who became successful in spite of, but it was success at a huge cost. The cost of failure, the cost of lowered self-esteem, and the cost of having to find a way to persevere in order just to believe in themselves. When I began my training in the late 80s, it was primarily private um, therapy from, from women that did not need to work outside the home. But uh, it quickly became, I've watched it over the last, since the 80s, become primarily public school teachers who come for training. We usually have one or two moms who uh, enroll in the class because they haven't found services for their children but primarily it's public school teachers. And that's because of Dr. Waits and the dyslexia law that, um, that encouraged the state law that put it into our public schools because there's so many children whose families could not afford private therapy. I just absorbed it. I, I just wanted everything that she had to give me, you know, to. I just wanted to remember it all. And there was so much of the language that I didn't even know about. I can remember one teacher sitting on the front row saying, why hasn't anybody ever taught me this before? I could have helped so many children if I had just known. My training was at Shelton with um, Dr. Beverly Dooley and Barbara Fox and Don Jones. And so ALIT really just gave me the idea that this was something that I would really enjoy doing but she didn't actually have anything to do personally with my training. But she had trained Barbara Fox and was part of, of Beverly's training. So um, I knew that what they were providing came straight from Scottish Rite Hospital and their staff and, and Ayla Cox. By the spring of 1963, the Hockaday School brought in a guest speaker from Yale University, a man who had pioneered the whole area of adult medicine and had seen the learning challenges at it as they began to impact teenagers. There were over 400 interested parents, concerned parents, who attended this meeting. It was covered by the newspaper and there was a great response from that. As a matter of fact, the clinic received between 200 and 300 phone calls within the next week. And the waiting list for evaluation jumped to 150 children. At Scottish Rite, 
we point to that and say, and that was the beginning of a waiting list at Scottish Rite. Dr. Waits had been at Scottish Rite for three years, 1968, and the hospital agreed to host a meeting of the World Federation of Neurology. The purpose of the meeting was to formulate a consensus medical definition of what was known then as dyslexia. The definition was for specific developmental dyslexia. This meeting was held in the new dyslexia laboratory at Scottish Rite. It was chaired by Dr. Waite's mentor, Dr. McDonald Critchley from London. Attending this meeting were neurologists from around the world. Dr. Waite, his mentor, Dr. McDonald Critchley, and there was one other neurologist from Texas. His name was Dr. Stanton J. Barron. He happened to be my pediatrician. Because of Dr. Barron, Dr. Waits visited Abilene, Texas, my hometown, and brought with him evaluation of children with dyslexia. It was the opportunity for my family to determine why my brother, the youngest child of several sisters who were academically successful, was so gifted in his verbal abilities and yet could not learn to read. Dyslexia was identified, but there was no training for teachers. So my brother was faced with knowing he had dyslexia, but having no way to address it. So the passion from that event was my introduction to dyslexia within my family and led me to a career to determine that children would not only be identified with dyslexia, but would have the opportunity for the intervention that you're so involved in and so invested passionately in, in seeing that children get the help they need. By 1975, Dr. Waits made the decision to move the teacher training program from the hospital to the Dean Learning Center into an educational facility versus a medical facility. And during that time, programs began to proliferate. It was as though what had begun as a hothouse or a springboard at Scottish Rite was now creating offshoots of powerful programs. Lennox Reed opened the Nyehouse Learning Center in Houston. Carol Hill left Dean to open the Oak Hill School, as June Shelton had before her to open the June Shelton School. There was the program that developed in Lubbock, the Scottish Rite Learning Center of West Texas that began a teacher training program as well as the SMU Learning Therapy Program. Programs were proliferating, as were schools that took care of children with dyslexia. There, in addition to the ones I've mentioned, there was also Dallas Academy. And one of the publications that we made is this that I'm holding, and every, uh, every trainer or author of a program wrote their story of how they began. And the very first one in the book is Alphabetic Phonics, and it was written uh, by Ailette Cox. And so she's talking about the history uh, of how she worked uh, for over 10 years, from 65 to 75, to um, evolve the Orton-Gillingham basic program into Alphabetic Phonics. Uh, so she talks about this history, and then what's wonderful is she talks about that she needed to uh, revise the instant spelling deck uh, to shorten and simplify Gillingham's drill pack. So Anna Gillingham's drill pack, and of course Anna Gillingham worked with Dr. Samuel T. Orton, is here in this very old box was given to me by Dr. Sylvia Richardson. And as you can see, it's 
very comprehensive. <laughs> and so Alet worked on that as, as well as many other things um, and reached out to so many people. Emslick published this in 1995 and it's a wonderful historical document. My friend Karen Averett says it the best because she and I are involved in our accreditation organization, Emslick. And when we go for SOSET visits to accredit a course, the reading practice page might not look exactly like what I've been accustomed to, and the spelling practice might not be exactly the way I do it, but those children are reading and those children are spelling. And so it goes back to the Orton-Gillingham principles of instruction, as long as we maintained the standards and as long as we taught the science of the language, that there were multiple ways that we could teach different concepts. The Presbyterian churches, possibly due to some influence from Dr. Luke Waits, began to see setting up schools for children with learning disabilities within the church as an outreach mission. And a school began known as the Highland Park Presbyterian Mediative School, now known as Hillier, at the Highland Park Presbyterian Church, and at, one at, also at Preston Hollow Presbyterian Church. This was also a period when new variations of curriculum began. Edmar had begun a teacher training program, and they had focused on the train, and that was Edith Hogan and Margaret Smith. And they had begun to focus on the public school educators and began to develop a curriculum that organized, in a new way, the historical materials of Orton Gillingham and alphabetic phonics that would serve them well teaching teachers and teaching children in a different environment and it increased the scale of how teachers could be taught and uh, learn the materials. Dr. Waits was focused on increasing the scale of children who could be helped at one time, and he began to think about broadcasting via satellite into every school district in Texas. At 10 o'clock each day, a dyslexia lesson would appear on what he referred to as the tube, and the children would surely pay attention because they loved television. But it turned out the expense of satellite time was about $100,000 a minute, and the hospital was not interested in the support for that type of program, so he shifted to videotaping. The therapist in our dyslexia lab began a revision of alphabetic phonics to bring about daily lesson plans that could be filmed daily. And they were in a classroom or in a studio. They were in a video studio. Patricia Beckham and Marietta Biddle were in a video studio and began daily videotaping of the dyslexia training program that became the most used program in the state of Texas during its time. And I was told by Dr. Waits that he told them he would come there if they would let him start a dyslexia program. And they agreed and he then started to work with Alette Cox. Uh, Anna Ramey was there working with him uh, Dr. Shelton was next door in Dean Learning Center. When we first started out with our training, it was only private. She trained us to teach one-on-one -on -one with the children, even though in the lab they were beginning to experiment with groups of six in the Scottish Rite Lab. Um, and then in 1985, when the law came into effect, there was a need for this in public schools. Aylid had tried many times to get it in public schools and had been unsuccessful. Then finally, when Tyne C. Miller built the law, it all happened for us. And that's when people began to take the training on the road and public school teachers began to get the training they needed to help these children. And they all love their jobs. I haven't met a teacher yet that doesn't love her job.
working with those children. So the work of Dr. Waits and uh, Alette Cox was, in my mind, the reason that in the Dallas area we have so many language therapists, academic language therapists. Um, they created the training and the program that would allow more and more and more teachers to know what to do to help all children learn to read. I can still hear her saying over and over in class, we've got to figure out a way for public school teachers to have this information. We can't just keep it to ourselves. She talked about that over and over and over in class. The branching of uh, going from that original work by Dr. Waits and Alette Cox uh, came about because there were many people across the country that were delivering various courses. 1985, the Texas legislature introduced two bills requiring our Texas public schools identify children with dyslexia and treat them. That, those laws would not have been passed without the tireless efforts of Tynesy Miller. Tynesy had been a dyslexia therapist in the dyslexia lab at Scottish Rite. She had also been impacted in her family with a son who had learning challenges that were not identified and not addressed. And she knew the heartbreak as a family of what happens uh, when problems are not identified and addressed. And Tynesy was tireless walking down the granite floors of the Texas legislature. And let me tell you, she did that in high heels in those days. I know that because I was there with her. Here Tynesy is at the signing of the dyslexia laws. And along with her, there's one young Gladys Kalinowski uh, making sure that Mark White signs those legislation. Another thing that I really uh, appreciate about Tynesy Miller and Aylett and Dr. Waits, although Aylett wasn't as much a part of it, is the handbook that we have in Texas. Because many states don't have a handbook that outlines screening and assessment and the components that a, a research-based um, instruction should include. And so I, I appreciate that work that both Tynesy Miller and, and Dr. Waits had a part in. Tynesy was immediately appointed to the Texas State Board of Education and then elected to that board for decades, retiring only recently from the Texas State Board of Education. She made a difference. The Texas laws would not have remained on the books and would not have developed procedures and processes to identify and treat children effectively in the Texas public schools. Texas is known throughout the United States as the state with the first and best dyslexia identification processes and intervention programs, effectively addressing what was, for many children, something that uh, was a barrier to their success. I will always be indebted for, to Aylett for not only for teaching my daughter to read, but also for all of the people and the, the students and the teachers that she has trained over this time. And I just, I mean, all these programs that we have that are so wonderful, uh, MTA and Alphabetic Phonics and Take Flight and basic language skills, they all come from the same Orton-Gillingham lessons that Ayla taught us. And what a legacy she has left us. For certain, Ayla Cox and Dr. Waits are where we are, to, and Tynesy Miller, are where we are today in the state of Texas. They were the ones who fought so hard for that dyslexia law. Just believe in what you do. You know what works. And, and that's the other thing that Aylett would always talk about was, you know what works, and if somebody is trying to influence you to do something different, you need to continue to do what you know is right. And 
stay student-centered as far as your focus. So after, after the 10 years at the hospital when they were developing alphabetic phonics, then individuals that had come to the hospital for the training wanted to take that back to their state. And so individuals like Judith Bursch at Columbia Teachers College in New York. But when others had come to the hospital for the training and then wanted to take, it, take that back to their home state, that's when the branches. And then um, Nyhaus Education Center in Houston contacted Ayla to come to Houston and help them set up their training center. So that's how, that's how the branches got started. I don't think Ayla ever knew the legacy that she would leave on how many programs were fashioned after her basic program of alphabetic phonics that she wrote. I don't think that ever occurred to her. There was a time when little was known about dyslexia, much less how to provide instruction to students who were struggling with reading and writing. The seed was planted and roots began to form through the work of Dr. Samuel Orton and Anna Gillingham, who aligned multisensory instruction to written language. They continued to cultivate these techniques over time. In Texas, the tree begins to grow when Aylett Cox is trained in the Orton-Gillingham methodology and subsequently authors alphabetic phonics. As the trunk begins to form, it is strengthened through the support of Dr. Lucius Waits and Texas Scottish Rite Hospital for Children. From that auspicious beginning, training begins to branch out, reaching more educators across the state of Texas. Those who provide services and support to students with dyslexia in Texas can all trace their knowledge and expertise back to the roots of dyslexia instruction established by these pioneers in the field. One thing that Ayla always talked about was when you're when you uh, form stalactites and stalagmites that it's done one drip at a time and that when you're teaching students it's the same process it's one drip at a time you do it as slow as you need to but as fast as you can so that was that was i remember her saying that over and over and so never stop working with a student always continue to work even if it's one drop at a time you're, you're going to get there eventually, or he's going to get there eventually. Mm -hmm.